All right. A national, maybe international, health information backbone that would help healthcare work as it should. Uh, frictionless exchange of information. Uh, it could be you know, financial information, clinical information, plug and play, self service integration. This is something we need as a nation, maybe as a, uh, across the world. It would help us in so many ways. I believe it would help us achieve many of the goals that the ACA has set out to help us achieve. But in addition to that, we would also need aligned incentives to help support that exchange, and that's something that's still not in place. Uh, we believe there is a better way and that that national health information backbone would help support it. And as Jonathan Bush, my partner at Athena Health, said this morning, the future is now. It's just not evenly distributed. There are places around the country where this is happening today, and it's a wonderful thing because not only does it support better clinical care delivery, more cost-effective care delivery, but it actually also supports something extremely important, one of the main reasons we're together here. It supports continuous innovation. One of the real barriers to innovation in healthcare is just accessing the market. And if you have a national health information backbone that gave innovators and entrepreneurs access to the providers, I think innovation would, would flourish. Uh, hi folks, my name's Steve Kahan and I'm president of the Enterprise Division at Athena Health. Uh, it's great to be here. We offer, as many of you know, a set of cloud-based services. You should think of that as a set of software-enabled services that help providers with revenue cycle management, electronic health records, patient-provider communications, population health, and care coordination. And we do this by partnering with providers in a, in a way that's very low risk, no upfront payment, 90 day out anytime they want, uh, aligned incentives, very focused on results. And I think a lot of that, that and our model, helps explain the success we've had in the marketplace. That model is a pain in the butt to describe and explain, but it's essentially really good software combined with, ready, curated crowdsourced knowledge. That's a mouthful, curated crowdsourced knowledge. As an example, when we see a payer playing a game with a provider, rejecting a claim, we ask the five whys, we get the answers, we plug it into our rules engine, and never again will a provider uh, you know, be blocked from getting what they deserve. That's a good example of curated crowdsourced knowledge. Or a pay for performance program that maybe someone put in place where for a certain specialty we'll see across our network, it just isn't cost effective for them to worry about. Um, so that, uh, that's a quick overview of Athena Health. One of the things Athena Health is doing, and it's very relevant to the discussion today, uh, relates to the Affordable Care Act, and I'll uh, comment on that in a second. I'm delighted to be introducing this next discussion, which will be led by T.R. Reed, many of you know, uh, an uh, esteemed reporter, author, and student of health systems across the globe. I was very interested to hear how his shoulder was doing. Right? And he told me, one of the things that wasn't clear to me was just how many countries he actually got care from uh, for the shoulder, but he just told me 12 different countries. So a nice sampling. It's, uh, this is uh, an inc inc incredibly important topic uh, that we're all focused on. Uh, it's very important to improve care delivery in the country. And Athena Health right now is analyzing the data across our network, our national network. We have 52,000 providers on the network. And we're doing something like what we did with PayerView. Uh, PayerView was our effort to uh, provide transparency over how different payer behaviors impact provider productivity, provider uh, effectiveness, and efficiency. We're going to do the same thing for the ACA, uh, where across the country we're monitoring the impact of the ACA on health systems, hospitals, and medical groups, again, across the country. And on July 16th, We'll be publishing that uh, for everyone to see. We use the intelligence across our network. We have about 55 million patient records on that network. It's real-time data uh, that we get to leverage. And we're doing this in partnership with the Robert uh, Wood Found uh, Johnson Foundation. With this initiative, which we call uh, ACA View, I think we're providing a nice front row seat to how the ACA is playing out for providers of all sizes. And for this reason and many more, I'm excited uh, to be able to introduce the folks here and hear what they, they think is happening and going to happen with the ACA. I did warn them 
that actual data is going to come out on July 16th. So I'm going to monitor their predictions against actual very carefully. Uh, but without further ado, let me turn it over to T.R. Reed, our moderator. T.R.? Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Reed. I'm a Coloradan, so I'm proud to say welcome to colorful Colorado in more ways than one, the highest state in the nation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> our topic today were, were is... Were those cookies safe out there? <laughs> <laughs> they come with a warning. Uh, our topic today is the biggest change in America's healthcare system in 50 years, and to discuss it, we probably have two of the leading experts in the whole country on health care systems and the Obamacare reform, one a Republican and one a Democrat. Our Republican is Tom Scully. He was the administrator, that is the boss, of Medicare and Medicaid under George W. Bush. And he got this radical idea that the government should help poor seniors pay for the prescription drugs they need to stay alive. And the result was Medicare Part D, another major change, and Tom was a key architect of that change. Uh, our Democrat is Peter Orzag. Now, he's an economist, and I know he's an economist, because I saw Peter at breakfast, and uh, the first thing he said, the first thing he said was, did you see the revised GDP figures this morning? <laughs> really? <coughs> uh, we'll, we'll he was uh, we'll President Obama's budget director. He was president at the creation of the Affordable Care Act. Now, I'm guessing, we're guessing that most people in this audience know a lot about this huge, complicated statute, but our hosts at Aspen have asked me just to give the briefest possible overview. And the Affordable Care Act stems from a fundamental paradox. The United States is the richest, strongest, most innovative country on Earth, but when it comes to keeping people healthy, we're a second-rate power. All the other industrialized democracies cover everybody. Most of them have better outcomes than we do. And on average, they spend half as much as the United States. So we're spending more and getting less. And of course, the US is the only advanced democracy that hasn't recognized a moral imperative to cover everybody. In 2008, a candidate for president, Barack Obama, called that a national disgrace. And he promised in every speech on every day of that campaign to provide health care for every American. The result was the Affordable Care Act. It's an incredibly complicated statute, but the centerpiece was an effort, is an effort, to expand insurance coverage to the uninsured, and it does it in two ways. About 16 million people are supposed to get insurance from private insurers in these online exchanges, and another 16 million were to get covered by the low-income insurance program, Medicaid. Uh, the major uh, uh, aspects took effect on January 1st of this year, so we're six months in. And so that leads to my first question. Peter, six months in, is it working? Yes. Um, so <laughs> there are two components here. One is coverage and the other is uh, cost and delivery system reform. Let me start on the latter one because that's been more surprising. <coughs> when the law was passed, everyone said it solves coverage, it does nothing on cost. And I think since then, the evidence has accumulated that there's a lot more happening on the cost side than people had appreciated. If you told me in 2008 or 2009 that Medicare costs in 2014 would be up a whopping 0.3%, $1 billion so far this fiscal year, the first eight months of this fiscal year, so on a real per beneficiary basis, significantly negative. If you told me that we would expand coverage, I'll come to that in a second, by roughly 7 million people net 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 of the people who were uninsured previously and healthcare expenditures would decline in the first quarter of 2014 if i went out and said that publicly i would have been dismissed as a quack yeah and yet that's exactly what's happened this is a massive massive thing if the medicare trend continues and we have to talk about what it, what would be involved in it continuing but if it were to continue everything you think you know about the long term fiscal gap facing the country would be wrong if uh, Medicare cost per beneficiary grow at, over, in, over the next seven decades at the same rate that they have on average over the past five years, the entire long-term uh, increase in Medicare as a share of GDP disappears. And that in turn means that almost the entire long-term fiscal gap facing the entire nation disappears. So this is a big deal. Now, just briefly on those GDP numbers, why was I so excited? Because <laughs> uh, there were all these uh, press stories based on the initial estimates for, that are uh, in the GDP 
that showed a very large increase, a very significant percentage increase, 9.9% .9 in the advance estimate and the 9% when it was revised for the first quarter of 2014. There were all these stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, blah, 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 that the slow growth that we've been experiencing over the past several years is over, okay? Uh, what people didn't point out is that the first two estimates of the GDP numbers are based disproportionately on what the government agency calls judgmental trend, mm -hmm. which is otherwise known as making it up, <laughs> without any real data whatsoever. And yet, if you looked around at the, at the different components, it seemed kind of odd, because if you looked at publicly traded hospital companies, HCA, uh, LifePoint, and what have you, their same store admission rates were flat to down. If you looked in various other outpatient settings, not a lot of growth. If you looked at employment, it was growing very slowly. If you looked at Medicare, it was not growing rapidly. So where was this magical growth? And we now know that number went from a plus 9% that, the, the, that was made up and that was the basis for all those New York Times and Wall Street Journal stories to this morning, minus 1.4% in, on a, in, on, in inflation adjusted terms. In other words, healthcare spending declined, and by the way, it declined even in nominal terms in the first quarter. This is massive. Before I turn to coverage, what, what are the consequences if it continues? Yes. Equally massive. Um, the Congressional Budget Office has, are, which I can, I, I, I used to run the Congressional Budget Office. I can assure you it's not a dynamic agency that likes to incorporate new information <coughs> in a really rapid fashion. Uh, instead, it likes to move slowly and cautiously. It has marked down our 10-year deficit number, almost no one knows this, it has marked down our 10-year deficit number by, depending on how you do the calculation, $900 billion to $1.2 trillion because of the ongoing deceleration in healthcare costs. Far larger than any of the policy interventions that people were debating. If that were to continue, it will help raise workers' take-home pay, it will help face our long-term fiscal gap at the federal level, and ultimately will make us better off as a country. I'll turn to coverage just really briefly, and I'm yeah. not going on too long. Okay. Um, eight million people covered under the exchange. Yeah. Eight million people <laughs> covered under the exchange. Six million new people uh, who have obtained coverage through Medicaid and CHIP. Um, disproportionately in the states that expanded Medicaid, who have seen a coverage expansion of about 15%. But even in the states that did not expand coverage under uh, Medicaid, there's been a roughly 3% increase in coverage because of the Woodward effect. Somehow people come out of the Woodward, they hear that oh. there's Medicaid expansion, and they say, oh, oh maybe, I'm, or maybe I'm eligible for it. And even though the state didn't oh. expand eligibility, there's been an increase in Medicaid even there. The best <laughs> estimates, and this is rough guesswork, suggest that about half of those people were previously uninsured. So the total is about 14 million, half of that 7 million people. There's 7 million people more today with health insurance in the United States than in the absence of this law. That strikes me as, you know, maybe it's not an A plus, but at least an A minus grade six months in. Cost and coverage, they're saying. That makes me tired. I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. Tom, is it working? Would I give it an A plus? I wouldn't give it an A plus. Yeah. I would give it, I, it's working about as I expected, if you'd ask me. I mean, the rollout was a disaster optically, and yes. I think that's unfortunate. The current administrator, CMS, is a good friend of mine, so I was not, you know, I feel badly having been through a couple of political disasters in healthcare. But, uh, you know, the problem is, uh, you can debate the, the numbers about, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here. Medicare Advantage is shrinking, probably rationally. So the Medicare Advantage, which is 31% of the program, actually had real cuts. So when you look at whether it's plus 8 or minus 1.4, you know, the real issue here is I, there are a lot of things I like structurally about the ACA. The major thing that's good about the ACA is, and it's not just the ACA, it's a trend in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, you had 12% of people in state Medicaid programs in managed care, now it's 75%. 10 years ago, you had 2.5%, almost 2.7% of people in private Medicare plans, now it's 31%. Uh, the exchanges are all private plans. The reason this is changing is you're getting away from single payer, price fixed, you know, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, which I never liked. I think that's the problem. Government fixing prices is the problem, to capitation. I think most people, uh, we discussed this morning, you know, when I sat in a plane next to uh, Howard Dean a couple, about a month ago, who I had one of the nicest casuals to meet, and when Howard Dean says to me, you know what, uh, price fixing doesn't work, we've got to move to captation, I'm like, wow. So structurally, the move that's helping here, is, and I agree that there's some good things about the ACA, uh, is the move to captation private plans, because the government setting, you know, I was involved in creating RBRBS in 1989, when I was in the White House working for Bush 1. You know, it just does, it didn't work. You get volume explosion. So getting back to the problems of the ACA, the problem of the ACA is the rollout has worked about as I expected. The problem of the ACA is it's a massive, gigantic, gargantuan, overdone entitlement expansion. And the two things that I have a problem with it, which have nothing related to the rollout, are that one, you've got 20 million people that are going to be added to the Medicaid rolls over the next decade. You've, 
you know, some number now. I happen to think those are the people that should be covered. We should cover four people first. Uh, you know, it's the right thing to do. The problem is Medicaid is a $600 billion program that's a fiscal disgrace. There are no rules. Every state cheats. All of you know there's provider taxes, disproportionate share payments. If you can find me one state medical director who can tell you what his match rate is, or anybody at CMS, I can tell you, because I spent the day yesterday with the former head of Medicaid, nobody knows what any state's match rate is. The entire program is a financial disgrace, and to build on that and add 20 million people without knowing what the second biggest entitlement program in the government is, is nuts. So I'm all for covering these poor people, but we should have go back and fit. There, how many conferences do you go to and somebody says, let's talk about Medicaid reform? The answer is nobody. And it's the second biggest problem in the government, and it's a complete and total disaster. It has been for 25 years, and nobody wants to talk about it. Tom Daschle, to his credit, has for years, and he's right. I would take the Daschle reforms tomorrow afternoon. But that's one problem. The second problem is I also think we should subsidize low-income uh, people who need help. Uh, I felt that way in Part D, but much yeah. like clo closing the donor hole in Part D is an insane policy. Subsidizing rich seniors for drugs is nuts. 14 million seniors have no co-payments, no deductibles. Covering a rich golfer uh, on the golf course for his drugs in Naples, Florida, to me is crazy. This, when you're talking about what's going on in the ACA, we're subsidizing people to 400% of poverty. That's 62% of Americans getting significant subsidies for a new entitlement program. That is the fundamental mistake. This issue here to me is not structure. The structure of the ACA, if you go back and look at the George Bush one, I've said this a lot publicly. I was one of the two people that put together the George Bush one health reform plan, and you probably remember in 1992. It looks a hell of a lot like the ACA structurally, with about 40% as much money. It's focused on low income people. The issue here is it is with Part D and the drug benefit is not the structure. I happen to like a lot of the structure of the ACA. It's, I think it's very similar to where Senator Kerry was going 20 years ago, or Senator Dole, or Senator Danforth. It was kind of the mid-ground compromise was individual mandates, exchanges, transfer payments, refundable tax credits. Uh, and if you'd asked the Democrat or Republican 20 years ago, what should we do? They'd say, we should do the federal employee health benefits SIP plan, which is basically where we're moving with Medicare Advantage, and we're moving with exchanges, and roughly we're moving with Medicaid. So uh, structurally, it's the right thing to do. The issue is, who do you want to subsidize? And when you get into a program where you're subsidizing 62% of Americans, it's insane. And if I went to you tomorrow and said, let's give housing vouchers and food stamps to 62% of Americans, you'd say, I have to have my head examined. And the problem you have is this program is going to be incredibly popular. I think it's going to be very unpopular due to the nasty rollout this fall, and I think Democrats will pay for it this fall. But as we've discussed, I think in yeah. two years it'll be really popular. Why is that? Because people love free stuff. And once you get 62% of Americans getting a big subsidy for health care, it had ever coming back, and you're all going to be paying for it. I personally have a big problem subsidizing some people in this audience. I think 62% of Americans for an entitlement program with big subsidies is way, way, way beyond what we should be doing. We should be focused on poor people and low-income people, not the middle class. And $94,400 for a family of four, which is what 40% of poverty is, is a hell of a lot of people. And once you start, it's not coming back. And that's the problem, and the problem is money. And okay, money. A uh, big new expensive entitlement program. When the bill was signed March of 2010, the official number was $940 billion over 10 years. Maybe you produced that. I don't know. No, well, that was my uh, subsequ the, uh, your subsequent successor, direct successor yeah, at yeah. CPO, yeah. Uh, is that a good number? What's it going to cost? That's as good a number as anyone can predict, but you, there's a false precision in the budget scoring where you go out 10 years and you're, you know, 940.03 billion, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. plus or minus 300 billion. Um, <laughs> and if, uh, if Tom's right that the uh, enrollment will actually pick up more significantly than uh, is embodied in those projections, then, for example, the cost will go up. But I would note the CBO was also very, very conservative on scoring or incorporating any benefit from delivery system reform, from moving away from fee-for-service payment, and so on and so forth. To the extent that that stuff works, that also will, you know, in the, in the opposite direction, have an effect on the federal budget. I think a lot of the pro policy changes to move towards private plans, capitation, uh, and all these programs, ACOs, we'll, we'll talk about, I'm sure, you know, it's not full capitation, but it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. It's a move in the right direction. Changing and putting, taking, the issue here is you're taking risk out of the states and out of the federal treasury and put it in the hands of people, nonprofit or for-profit, with private capital. And that delivers better results. I think that's heading in the right direction. Uh, so there are a lot of things about the ACA, you know, structurally that I have no problem with. The issue, which really gets into it, is money and how much federal money should go out to subsidize people who are not poor. And I think that's really the fundamental issue. I think a lot of Republicans can say, this is a big government takeover of healthcare. It's evil, it's terrible. By the way, I had a lot of Democrats say something about Part D when I was cooking up. It was the worst thing 
ever happened in the history of America. Oh, so a really? lot of this is just politics. Oh, believe me, I got. I can show you my press clips if you like. Yeah, but on the uh, other hand, I but, mean, you know, at the least... fact is, it's a, that happens in election year. But the long-term discussion, which it was in Part D, Democrats want to spend a trillion dollars. We want to spend four hundred billion uh, on Part D when it passed. And you know, the issue is who should you subsidize with how much money? And that's the fundamental difference. Uh, I think really the structural uh, part of the ACA is fairly middle ground policy. It's all about how many people get what subsidies, and, they, and that's that is the key issue. Well, See, I, well I, actually, yeah. I actually have a different perspective, I, yeah. and I think we actually share our, a view on this, but I actually view the key, you're focused on how do you deliver insurance, whether it's subsidized or not, to, to more people. I think the more important question is how do we align incentives on the delivery side so that total health expenditures are, uh, you know, we're getting more for our health care dollars, which really doesn't have to do with whether the government's paying for the insurance or the individual's paying for the insurance, it's how much are you actually improving your health through uh, the healthcare dollars that are provided, and can we do a lot better, and what structures will improve that value? Oh, I think, I think it has a hell of a lot to do with what the individual are paying for it. I, and I, again, I would do more catastrophic coverage for people higher than the income stream. But wait till you get a load, you know, one of the big issues, and I have enough support it with the ACA. You look at Pittsburgh right now. In Pittsburgh, you know, they just came out with the second lowest silver plan in Western Pennsylvania. If those are familiar with it, it's the Highmark Blue Cross plan, which, by the way, doesn't include anybody at the University of Pittsburgh. You know, 75% of the providers in Pittsburgh are in the University of Pittsburgh medical center system. Guess what? Are not no, covered. None of them are covered. So wait till those people wake up and say, I can't go to my hospital, my doctor. Well, if you're going to drive better behavior and save costs, you got to make tough calls like that. If you're yeah. going to subsidize people, you got to say, we're going to subsidize you to a relatively tight network. There's going to be an instant replay I went through with the Clinton issues with managed care in the, in the 90s. You can't have everybody get everything. And if you're going to make them make those choices, they got to spend some of their own money. Or they're going to demand that I get coverage for everything. But we do have to make people make yes, those choices, and, and this is the, one of the things I like about the ACA is, you know, and we discussed this before, you look at the ACA, what is it? It's premium support for people under 65 years old. You give people a bunch of choices of plans and you yes. subsidize the second lowest silver cost plan. Republicans say we hate the ACA. Democrats say we hate Medicare premium support. Well, guess what? Medicare premium support, which a lot of Republicans for, is in fact the ACA if you're over 65. And Obamacare is what yeah. Republicans like, which is Medicare premium support if you're under 65. It's the same damn thing. And the, they're Except talking past for each the other. People it's, under 65, it's private insurance. Medicare is a government program. No, uh, it, 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 well, for 30% it's private. No, in premium yeah. support, it's, yeah. it's private. That's so I, I think yeah. Tom's touched on uh, a, there will, there's going to be a lot of public discussion about, and there already is some, but we haven't, we haven't even come close to the, you know, all the media stories about the narrow networks and the ultra narrow networks that are necessary to keep the, um, the plans on the exchanges at reasonably priced and that every payer, every insurance company is deploying to varying degrees. Um, we are going to have, you know, the, the person who signed up, paid the premiums, did this, did the right thing, uh, got diagnosed with X, and then doesn't have access to the leading academic medical center in town because it's not yeah. part of the network. And that's going to be a compelling story of, like, well, why did that person not have access to world-class medicine because the plan excluded it? On the other hand, if you start, uh, if you start unwinding those narrow networks and, and forcing more... Uh, expansive networks, the premium prices go way up. So that's going to be a big source of tension. I think the ultra narrow networks and the narrow networks in general are going to hold because the pressure against, uh, the, the counter pressure against upward uh, price points is going to be significant. The other big topic is going to be we're going to have millions of Americans who are churning between Medicaid and the exchange. So as your income goes up, you go off Medicaid, you go onto the public exchange. As your income goes down, you go off the public exchange and onto Medicaid. So, uh, and they often have different networks, different coverage. So wait a minute, I just got a job and now I can't see my doctor? Or I lost my job and now I can't see my doctor? Yeah. Those but issues are going to you know, have some that's force. That's going to be a problem. But if you, if you really hope that the cost curve is going to bend because of these, quote, reforms, the biggest reform is driving people in these network plans where they don't have a choice of anything. And what's going to happen? You know what? If you're in Nashville, uh, I happen to love Vanderbilt. Somebody's probably here is going to get mad at me. But, you know, yeah. you can't have all the Vanderbilt care on your network. And if you're in Pittsburgh, you can't have all the UPMC. They're incredibly expensive teaching facilities that have had very bloated costs over the years. And part of this goal is the pressure to bring some of those costs in the line. And that's what's going to happen here. And it's going to be painful. It's not going to be... So easy. Th but see, wait, hold on one second. This is yeah. why we kind of... Uh, differ a bit because, again, Tom's putting a lot of emphasis on the design of the uh, subsidies and the narrow networks on the exchanges. Let's look at what's happening in Medicare, for which none of that's relevant. Yes. We've had a massive deceleration, as I already mentioned, in Medicare, 
which you can't explain based on the economy. There's basically no cyclical effect on Medicare spending. It's not largely prices. There are, there are legislated uh, payment reductions in Medicare, but most of the deceleration to date has been in utilization. And it, you know, what's driving that? And I think that is a massive story that is a good indicator of potential structural change in healthcare that we need to be doubling down on. Well, fewer a lot of people on Medicare are going to the doctor and going to the hospital, is what you're saying? Uh, they are receiving fewer, it, it, well, there are several things. Uh, readmissions are down. I, in fact, I find the readmission oh. story to be the best vignette of what's happening. I'm going to tell a little story. You know story. what this means? This means you get out of the hospital and three weeks later you're back in the hospital for the same thing. That's 20 percent of Medicare beneficiaries historically discharge from the hospital back in the hospital within a month, which by the way no one wants. So I'm going to tell a little vignette based on Mount Sinai's experience. Mount Sinai has targeted the people at, mo at highest risk of readmission uh, using an algorithm built into the electronic health record it's, and then put a team of social workers on uh, those people and had resounding success for those highest risk uh, people. Uh, it's not rocket science. You make sure people take their medication, they show up for their doctor's appointments, and emergency room vi visits fall by 50%, readmits fall by 50%. Here's the problem. Right now, Mount Sinai, or at least as of the last time I checked uh, six months ago, Mount Sinai loses a significant amount of money on that program because you lose basically the revenue on the readmitted patients. Yes. You also avoid a penalty on high readmissions, but the big driver right now is that you lose the revenue on readmitted patients. Ken Davis, who runs Mount Sinai, is here. One of the reasons they're doing it is it's the right thing to do. Another reason they're doing it is they anticipate that within three to five years, that will flip from being a big net financial loser to a big net financial winner. Because if you're in a system, like Tom was mentioning, where you're capitated, where you get a fixed payment per person per year yeah. for all the care that someone needs, when they're readmitted, that comes out of your bottom line rather than adding to your bottom line. And so if you have to start turning the aircraft carrier now, you better start doing it. Therein lies, I think, the biggest risk, which is there, a lot of what's happening is based on expectations that that change in the payment system is coming. Right now, nationally, only about 10% of revenue is value-based in that, in that kind of category. Hospital executives writ large think that within three to five years, more than half of their revenue will be value-based. And if we don't deliver on that, both through private insurance and through Medicare, I think a lot of these programs will kind of Yeah, this fade. doesn't affect the AC, though. I mean, I started doing quality measures no, no, I agree. in 2003. I, and pay, you know, paying differentially for quality is a great thing. But the fact is, when you're in fee-for-service medicine, all this is a, is a move in the correct direction. Right. But if I'm paying you, it's like going out and buying cars for the Defense Department saying, you know, we'll pay plus 2% for Mercedes and minus 2% for a Yugo. I mean, yeah. you're still on the margins. It's better than no, nothing. No, no, you need more high-powered incentives. You need yeah. Yeah. These yeah. incentives are just the, beginning the, to change. The ones that are being done today at the federal level, the Medicare ACOs, the shared savings, are pretty weak T. And the results are, you know, pretty weak also. More potent uh, interventions, for example, in Massachusetts, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts has the alternative quality contract, which is a stronger set of incentives. And the results there, and, and something like 30 to 40 percent of payments in, Med in Massachusetts are now covered by that contract. That's showing better results than the shared savings ACO and even the premier ACO. But in fairness, not to pick, I'm going to get in trouble with Mount Sinai too, but New York and Boston aren't exactly examples for the country. I mean, the best example of the country that's been working for the last 25 years is California. California, many more people are in managed care. Many more people, the physicians are generally in capitated groups. They have taken risk for years. The number one way to change behavior, which has come in the New York and Boston, is to get the doctors involved, give them financial incentives, which we're starting to do in Medicare, and saying, guess what? If you get your patients on generic drugs and you get them to yeah. not go in the hospital as much, and you make sure you don't do as many tests, and we show you the data, you get to get some of the money. Right. And they change the behavior overnight. It's been going on in California for many, many years. It's uh, that California's costs are way below the rest of the country. And this is really what the best things about the ACA is that kind of capitated getting physicians more involved, driving better behavior in the system is slowly creeping in. That's my point. That, the rest but of the, the problem right now is uh, too many providers, it's sort of the worst place to be is to have a foot on the dock and a foot in the boat. And you're, you're, you know, you've got a lot of fee-for-service, you know, the underlying engine, and then a little top-up of value-based payment. We need to move much more definitively, give providers a glide path for how this is going to happen, a goal. I think by 2018, we should have 75% of Medicare revenue being not fee-for-service. 
and, all, and then intermediate goals on the way there, and then also some clarity about what are we gonna do? Because people say, we're moving away from fee-for-service, but that's great. Is it an ACO 3.0? Is it bundled payment that cascades out um, over more and more episodes? What exactly is the structure? Because right now there are all these different programs floating around, and providers have to try to hit all these different indicators, and we need to give them more clarity about it's kind of like a blob out there, and you're turning the aircraft carrier in response to the blob, but we need to provide a much more This is a trend specific. day on the ACA. When I got to HICFA, I changed the name to CMS the first week I was there just to cause chaos. <laughs> um, you know, we had 2.5% of people, 2.7%, I think, in, in Medicare Plus Choice was called back then. And when we cooked up Medicare Advantage and started trying to get more people into capitation, we were like, oh, this is insane. You're destroying the Medicare program. And now I think Democrats and Republicans, for the most part, most of them agree that getting into a global capitation drives better efficiency. So I think that's yeah. a good trend. We agree on that across the board. That's so, okay. a big so, philosophical wait, one more, change. Just one more yeah. quick point. All the right. only difference, and this is really frustrating, an example of polarized politics just impeding progress. Both sides, to Tom's point, both sides now agree we should have a cap, we should move away from fee-for-service payment, we should have capitated payments with a quality adjuster on the front end, and a risk adjuster on the front end, a quality adjuster on the back end. The only difference, basically, is Democrats really want that payment to go to the provider in the form of an ACO or some sort of bundled payment, and Republicans still favor it going to the payer, the insurance company. The irony is, as the insurance companies move towards uh, these programs anyway, as I think Ken Davis and others said earlier today, the providers are becoming, pay, are becoming insurance companies partially anyway. So that dividing line gets very blurry. Yeah. It always was a little bit blurry. But that is the, that is the core disagreement between the Republican ver vision and the Democratic vision for moving to capitated payment. And Ron Wyden, the new head of the Senate Finance Committee, has a bipartisan bill because he is agnostic on that question and says it can go to either one. And, and so why can't we do that? And if there's any hope for health care, it's that Ron Wyden is a great, smart guy who I like a lot, and Paul Ryan, I think a lot alike. They're going to be running health care for the next 10 years, and they're both thinking in this direction. Unfortunately, way too many. I think, you know, everybody says the good old days were so much better. The fact is, 25 years ago, there were, you know, 10 Democrats and 7 Republicans in the Senate that talked to each other, got along, and actually talked about yes, policy, right. and now no, they, they just don't. lob grenades yeah. at each other. And fortunately, the two, the two of the people that actually talked to each other know a lot about health care policy are Ryan and Wyden, and that... that yeah hopefully will help. But, you know, th this is, um, uh, th really comes back to it. We're Structurally, we're going the same direction. When you really get into it, you're talking about Medicare. When you get into Medicaid, and it it's really comes down to how much money do you want to spend on the federal government? And we've talked past that. That is the core issue. When you get past the Republicans' argument, which I would agree with you about reform and replace, re repeal and replace, they don't need to replace it with. The real issue is scale it back. And that's probably not going to happen. Do you right. really want to spend this level of your federal tax dollars on the guy down the street that's making ninety-four thousand dollars for ninety-four thousand four dollars a year. Well, and you, do you start want an entitlement. Can you scale it back? Never. An there's never been. Well, there's been one. But briefly, <laughs> welfare was scaled back. All right. Back so now I just want to say I, I have just a couple more questions, and then we'd love to have your questions if you have questions for the experts here. Uh, here's my question: Half, as I said, half of the expansion of insurance coverage under this bill was supposed to come from the Medicaid expansion. Half of the states have refused to take the Medicaid expansion. Look, I'm a cynical reporter. I feel that this is largely a bunch of Republicans sticking it to Barack Obama. But let me ask you, is there a legitimate reason for a state to turn down the Medicaid expansion? Peter? I'm trying really hard to come up with one. Uh, no, I think, look, I, I do think over time, uh, two, two points quickly. Tom's point about Medicaid being structurally, uh, you know, we can do a lot on the structure of Medicaid to uh, do exactly what I was just saying, which is to start aligning incentives, especially for the dual eligibles, the people who are eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare, where it's basically a walking disaster zone of unmanaged, uncoordinated care. They're very expensive, they're, their care is very complicated, and we do a terrible job. But I, I, I would separate that from can we expand Medicaid and fix that problem also? Tom basically is saying, don't expand it until that's fixed. I'm okay expanding it while you try to fix that. So that's the first point. The second point is, I think the number of states that are out will decline over time because you just need one alignment of the governor and the legislature to say yes, and then to the point that we were discussing earlier, it's asymmetrical, it's a ratchet effect. Once a state adopts, they're not gonna drop it. So over time, if you ever get that alignment in whatever configuration where they say yes, the share just goes up instead of down. 
Tom, is there a legitimate reason yeah. for the governor to turn down Medicaid? That's, none of them have the one now, but the, they're doing it for <laughs> political reasons. But the legitimate reason, look, the Southern governors do it because they're because of politics. And you know, Rick Scott, who I, I used to run the for-profit hospital governor trade Florida. association in the 90s when he ran HCA, uh, you know, he tried to do it and got cream. Most Southern governors have tried to have gotten cream. Yes. So I wouldn't say they haven't done it for legitimate reasons, but there is a very legitimate reason that none of them are, are using. We have 72 million people right now uh, on Medicaid, and it's going to grow. It's a giant program, soon to be bigger than Medicare, and it's a joke. I mean, I'm on the board of the Dartmouth Med School. How much money do you think New Hampshire puts into this Medicaid program? Have any idea? Zero. They pull 120 million, last I could figure, out of Medicaid in a reverse funding scam to pay for road building. How many people talk about that? I call it live for free or die. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, and how, <laughs> this, is, this is, you guys are paying for this. And I happen to love Dartmouth, I love New Hampshire. It's, a, it's the politics they're stuck in. It was all, you know, it's, it's, they backed into this. But when you have a program that big and it's financially broken, you know, my view is we should cover poor people. We should expand into Medicaid. But the legitimate reason to say, look, the reason Democrats argue is this is free federal money. It's 100% federal. How can you turn it down? Well, the reason is the program's a disaster. And I, I happen to support Tom Daschle's. Uh, long time view of Medicaid, which is we had to just figure out what the states are now and come up with a capitated split and go on from there and you know fix it gradually over 20 years. But you can't just go and say, hey, get, let's take 100% federal money and keep pumping money into this broken machine, take it from 72 million people to 90 million people. You know, the program is a fundamental disaster. And anybody that understands it would tell you there are no rules. And how you can expand an entitlement program like this and just say, cover your eyes, don't worry about it, 100% federal will be okay, is totally irresponsible. I don't think any Republican governors have made that argument. They've made complete bogus arguments. Yes. But that is a good argument. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Now, in January, the chairman of the uh, Republican National Committee said that in this year's November election, the Republicans were going to hang Obamacare around the neck of every Democrat in the country and therefore sweep the elections. Is this still true? Will Obamacare be a detriment to Democrats, or is, are the Republicans missing something here? Well, I, we, I think that, you know, you look at the polling numbers, which, you know, I usually have a graph. They've yeah. consistently been about 12 percent over the last six months to the negative for President Obama. The rollout, for better or worse, was an optical disaster. I think when you get to June and the numbers are like that, they're probably not going to change much. My guess is in net, just because of the rhetoric and the optics, and there is no more open season this year. It is what it is. Uh, between now and November, it's going to be a disaster for Democrats. I still doubt the Republicans will take the Senate personally. Just when you look at the races, they'd have to win a lot of r close races. But I think in net, it's a very good thing for Republicans in the fall. I think every day that goes beyond that, you know, more and more people are going to get this, that it's a lot of big subsidies. They're going to sign up. And I think by the time you get the 2016 presidential election, the numbers will cross. It'll be a very good thing for Democrats. I think the rhetoric right now is terrible for Democrats. I think it'll turn. And I think it's going to turn because they're handing out a lot of cash, and I think to too many people. Peter, what do you think this fall in 2016? Uh, three things. First, uh, this is one of the areas in which the political analysts, the political scientists, uh, were just wrong. They uh, Basically, all the political operatives said, as soon as the law is in place, its popularity will rise rapidly. And it seems like the lag involved in that is a bit longer than had been anticipated. Um, the second thing is, uh, I, I don't know exactly what role it will play in the Senate elections in particular, but uh, at least for the operations of the ACA, I think the implications of a, a Republican victory uh, are much more modest in 2014 than is often appreciated. We are not going to have a repeal of Obamacare, even if both the House and the Senate turn, or, or the Senate turns Republican and the House remains Republican. Instead, the implications will come up on much more targeted issues, like the medical device tax and a few other um, more targeted issues, but writ large, I'm not sure. And then by the, by the time of the presidential election, I do, at least I hope, that uh, its popularity will be higher than it is today. And, and uh, you know, I totally agree with everything he said, and I just think when you get into the, the politics, even if you get a Republican Senate, Republican House, which I think is unlikely, especially after 2016, because the, the tables turn next time, Republicans have way more people up. Even if they get the Senate by one vote next year, they'll probably have a good chance to lose it in 2016. Yeah. But let's yeah. say you have miraculously had a Republican president, Republican House, Republican Senate in 2016. It's still not going to be repealed. The votes aren't there. Yeah. And there's going to be so much of this in place, it's going to be very hard to roll back. It might be nibbled on. But this thing is you know, not going to be repealed. It's not going to be replaced. It's going to be modestly changed, if at all. And we're going to have to learn to deal with it. Uh, any questions out there? It's hard for me to see. If anybody, yeah. Yes, sir.
He's asking about the... Right, the SGR. And um, I'm just wondering, since uh, it sounds like Medicare hasn't grown much, is, is the SGR just going to die off because um, the um, spending in Medicare has not gone up? Or, you know, there were was, there was some good proposals that unfortunately uh, didn't make it through at the end. How do you feel about some of those proposals? Or, um, what are we going to do about the SGR in the, in the coming years? So I'll, I'll take tell them what the SGR is. So the SGR is the sustainable growth rate formula. It's the formula that's u it's the structure that's used to reimburse physicians under Medicare. Um, it uh, was adopted in the late 1990s, and a big deficit built up into it. In it, so that each year there was a legislated roughly 20 percent payment cut yeah. for physicians that were. It was about to happen like Charlie Brown, and then Congress would step in at the last second and take it away to keep them flat, and then it, again and again and again. And uh, physicians are kind of sick of it. I think anyone who follows this is kind of sick of it. It's sort of a silly game. It's, our, it's one of our last big extenders. We've gotten rid of the tax extenders to a large degree, not totally, but this is one of these kind of, again, Charlie Brown moments. Um, two things. First. The cost of getting rid of it and replacing it has gone down significantly because those Medicare numbers have come down. The problem is it's still more than $100 billion, and that's where uh, things blew up uh, earlier in the year where uh, there was no agreement on how you would meet that cost. But we have a, a big opportunity. Tom mentioned it earlier. Right now, the payment system under Medicare for physicians is one of the examples of this fee-for-service type of structure where Basically, how much you get paid depends on how much you do. And the reform that you're talking about was trying to move away from that uh, over time and towards more of a value-based payment system where how much you pay, get paid depends on how well you do it improving the health of your patients, which would make more sense. I, I'm not holding out huge hopes here for uh, a miraculous you know, outbreaking of bipartisan support and agreement on how we finance that $100 billion. Yeah. So uh, the SGR was created in 97, but it was actually passed. It was called the Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, which I was involved. That was the White House guy in 89. Who <laughs> remembers that? Uh, and it was, a it was a relatively rational attempt at a bipartisan compromise to find a way to control physician costs. And it's never really worked very well. And it's unfortunate. It's just created a lot of bad incentives. That, and uh, you know, it's, it's, Peter described it accurately. The problem is it's $140 billion to fix over 10 years. Find me, a, and it's got to be paid for. Find me $140 billion. So doctors aren't going to pay for it. They take a 24% cut next year. So you, what are the three big moving pieces in Medicare to pay for it? Doctors, who are going to get plus 24% just to get back to a freeze. Hospitals, who aren't going to get cut because there's no place to cut, number one. And number two, they're too politically tough. The last three fixes have been funded by little nicks in home health and long-term acute care hospitals and rehabs. And they basically take on all the poor little guys and scraped it out of the corners of Medicare that outside the two big chunks. And there's not much place to go. There isn't 140 billion there. So they're going to kick the can down the road for a couple more years and fix it one year at a time. It'll, you'll never take a cut. At some point, you're going to have a big global budget deal again at some point because it's going to have to be in a tax cut. And in the course of that, it will be fixed. But my guess is it'll be three or four years off. Yes, sir. Uh, we, many of us have been listening to Jonathan Bush today. And one of the things he stated, I don't know if it's true, is that you should close 55% of the teaching hospitals and 50% of the community hospitals. Now, with capitation, uh, the inefficiency that's in the existing system goes because these hospitals have empty beds and they can't stay alive without this enormous subsidy in the fee for service. It'll never happen. I mean, I'll, I'll have John, John, did you turn the speed down from 78 to 33? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Jonathan's structurally right. Hopefully he'll be, he won't run for office because he get killed saying that. But the, um, uh, you know, the reality is one thing you get to go to the CMS ministry is you go to like every district in the country with a Democrat and a Republican. And yeah. you go to these small towns, you may say, well, you're empty, your beds are empty. But the fact is you go to rural Iowa or rural Montana or Senator Bacchus or rural Wisconsin or rural Oregon, and they need those hospitals. So there's going to be a slow change from capitation that will be needed. But po politically, this stuff never happens quick. And you're not going to close those hospitals. Uh, in some places, I grew up in Philadelphia. Are there too many hospital beds in Philadelphia? Yes. Are there too many hospital beds in Texas or uh, parts of the country that are growing? No. So 
I think capitation will help, but you, there's no political way to go up and say, let's save costs and shut down those, you know, we looked at the Dartmouth Atlas and those 55% of hospitals need to be shut down. It's just politically not viable. It's because change comes very, very slowly in healthcare. I think we get a lot of things moving in the right direction, but it's slow. So I'm gonna answer this as an economist on academic medical centers and teaching hospitals. In fact, there was a debate in this, about this in the New England Journal that just came out. Um, here's, here's the thing, economists typically say, if you can take your training and go anywhere with it, then uh, you should be willing to basically pay for it yourself because it will show up in subsequent wages. Um, the counter argument is you need to subsidize the institution and provide various different forms of implicit subsidy to reduce the cost of that. Um, here's the problem with the argument that it, we should, you know, we can get rid of the subsidies and there still will be adequate uh, teaching that happens. Um, unless you believe that the ultimate payments for doctors out 15, 20 years, which is currently not fully market driven, it's you know, partially Medicare driven, yeah. uh, unless you believe that that is at a social, socially adequate level, then the story that economists typically tell, including in the most recent version of the New England Journal, is not right because uh, it's, it's, imp it's importing a theory which is right under perfectly competitive uh, situations that is not relevant to healthcare. And if you then accept that, then the question becomes, how are we going to train a, uh, the next generation of doctors if it's not, if it doesn't work for them to just basically self-finance through loans their entire education? Hey, look, look this is, none of this stuff is rational. I mean, if you want to, I'll get chill for saying this, but what the hell? You want to talk about a rational health system 25 years ago, I ever saw the VA health system. Veterans yeah. need health care. But you know what? The VA is unbelievably inefficient. You can give every veteran that you, alive and every person they've ever met free first dollar health care coverage to any facility you want and save money because the VA is basically, I think, $78 billion in the health care system this year. And the fact is, you know, there's a great VA hospital right next to Vanderbilt and one next to the University of Maryland and one next to every teaching hospital in the country. And the docs have dual staff privileges. Go out to rural Maryland or rural Tennessee where the veterans are. There's no hospitals there. The system is totally politicized. It's incredibly inefficient. And how many here people think the VA is going to be reformed in the next 10 years? It won't be. It's got a couple, it's got no, multiple hundred thousand employees. It's incredibly entrenched. It's incredibly inefficient. It's not providing good care to health to veterans, but it's not going to change because it's incredibly politically untouchable. And, uh, you know, the idea that we're going to become efficiency machines and do everything based on the rate economics, it's just not going to happen. Politics, Democrat or Republican, politics or politics, these things change very slowly. I hope the VA will slowly change and reform, but the VA has been a mess for a long time. It's also socialized medicine, I just want to point out. We've provided socialized medicine to our military it's heroes. It's politicized medicine. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's the problem. Uh, in the fourth row back here, yes, sir. Hi, Jack Rayburn from uh, Trust for America's Health in DC. Uh, great panel, thank you. Um, so one of the interesting things about the healthcare system, and uh, interesting is kind of like a loaded adjective, right? Um, is that it's a system that we use to deliver care to people, but it's also uh, a major employer in our country, and it's also thus a major part of our economy. So I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about what that means in terms of the GDP numbers we saw this morning, yeah. also kind of the long-term outlook. Sure, I'll take a crack at that. I mean, uh, I didn't highlight that the massive markdown in the healthcare component of GDP, which I think is a great thing for cost trends, also meant that GDP fell overall quite significantly in the first quarter, which puts a slightly different spin so on it. So you that. want your cake and eat it too, you want both? Well, yeah. what's good for healthcare is not always <laughs> not good for short term. Yeah. Um, uh, health employment trends basically for hospitals have been relatively flat for the last couple of years. In outpatient settings, there still has been um, employment growth. Uh, I think the only way that we can kind of reconcile uh, a lot of the, the imperative to have higher value healthcare and the central role. Hospitals are the second largest private sector employer in the United States after the, after the restaurants. Um, so it's a massive sector. Uh, how do you reconcile those two things? One of the ways we reconcile it is there's a lot that can be, it's the type of jobs. There's a lot that can be done to, re, to reduce or eliminate the scope of practice rules that limit what different types of people are allowed to do and that would help improve productivity without harming employment. And we should be pressing on that as much as possible because a lot of those rules, talk about dumb rules, a lot of those rules really don't make a lot of sense. Even with that though, we just have to own up to the fact that there's a little bit of tension. We've got 
I mean, if you take the, IOM, the Institute of Medicine estimates that maybe 5% of GDP is spent on healthcare services that don't actually improve health outcomes, yeah. there's going to be a bunch of pain involved in working that down in time, in t at least in terms of employment growth that would have happened but doesn't as we squeeze down on that. That still is a good thing to occur. It is always a mistake, and the course of history suggests it's always a mistake to try to preserve jobs artificially, I even if they're bloated or, or uh, inefficient, in the hope that that somehow uh, helps things. It, it never does. It, it may be a temporary uh, Band-Aid, but ultimately we all pay through reduced worker sure. take-home pay or through higher taxes for propping those jobs up, and it's not, it doesn't work. You know, the country's aging, people are getting older, their consumer health care, this is going to grow. The issue is how much is rational. You know, I started working in the Senate in 1980, and uh, I remember my boss going on the Senate floor and saying, health care is 5.5% of GDP, it's out of control, it's unsustainable. <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't the case. And my favorite professor may have left Uva back there. I'm used to ask him, say, well, health care was 17% of GDP, can it keep growing? Yes, because people want to consume health care, and they're going to keep choosing that. The issue is how much we rationally incentivize them to choose the most expensive health care. I mean, I think we spend a lot of time subsidizing, and I love them, big teaching hospitals and other e funds. We have a massive shortage of decent long-term care. Find a low-income person that can find a good nursing home they want to be in if they're on Medicaid, and as you get into that. You know, we have a lot of investments in the really expensive acute care hospital. Uh, we have a huge population coming to the pipeline of low-income, middle-income people that are going to need long-term care, and we don't spend any time talking about that. Yeah. And we're the, I'm a partner in the biggest investment firm in health care in the U.S. I can tell you, we wouldn't touch a nursing home chain with a 100-foot pole. It's a horrible business. None of you guys would want to be in it. I don't know any hospital administrator that wants to go run SNFs. That's, well, that's not a, a good, good thing. Good point. There was a long government long-term care operation in Obamacare when it passed. What happened to it? That was a total That was disaster. not very well designed. <laughs> <laughs> That was the worst. Well it's now defunct, is that right? No, it was eliminated. It was bad. It was yeah. not. It was massively underfunded. It was well intentioned and poorly designed from the beginning. Unfortunately, they realized that one of the more rational things Congress has done is on a bipartisan basis, they, they pulled it out right after it passed. Got it. Yeah, I saw a gentleman back here. Hi. One of the areas in the ACO we haven't addressed is the employee mandate. I uh, read a lot of news about how. Um, big employees like the Walmarts of the world, I, I don't know if it's Walmart, but some of the big ones are dumping employees into the exchanges because they're trying to avoid the double-digit premium increases that they would otherwise have to pay for insurance. Do you guys think that there's going to be a long-term adverse effect on employment or employers, you know, sort of hiring patterns as a result of this employee mandate? I'll take that first. So uh, I think before the Affordable Care Act came along, there was a movement uh, that has now accelerated towards basically defined contribution health care for uh, current employees. Um, I think it's likely that over the next two or three years that a large, iconic U.S. firm, and I don't mean Sar Sears or Darden or Walgreens that have already done it, I mean like an IBM, a GE, kind of a, you know, a, uh, again, an iconic U.S. firm, will set up a uh, private exchange for their employees like the federal government has yeah. long had with a defined stipend for going to purchase that insurance. And as soon as they do, you know, uh, HR people go to conferences too, and it will become the cool thing at an HR conference, and then there'll be a massive domino effect where a lot of other large employers will follow. Roll that forward. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the difference is or how much we should care as a nation between I get a stipend from my employer to go buy insurance among the following X options on a private exchange, or my employer has topped up my wages and I take that money and I go purchase the insurance on a public exchange, I guess we will kind of see that through. But uh, one of the things that's interesting is one of the key drivers, I believe, of this shift towards uh, higher cost sharing, more defined contribution elements within private uh, health insurance is not only the, it's not really the employer mandate, it's instead the, this looming Cadillac tax out in 2018 where there is a very significant tax imposed on higher cost insurance plans. And most companies want to make sure that they have a glide path to get in under those thresholds. One of the ways to do that is to increase cost sharing and move towards a defined contribution model for current employees. Totally agree. I think it'll be slower and more creeping. 
I think the tax incentives, I think if you ask Paul Ryan or, or Ron Wyden in the tax bill, one of the big things they both want to change, the tax incentive for health care, which will gradually, and will happen someday, speed this up. But employers, you know, there was no such thing as health insurance for World War II, and employers got into this by accident, and I think in the long run, when the incentives change, they want to get out of it. And people say, oh, no, they'll keep it forever. When we created Part D, most large employers had a retiree drug benefit. And they said, they'll never get out of it. They'll stay in it forever because they're low the employees. We actually paid them all $790 per head subsidy to bribe them to keeping them I mean, they didn't have to. What happened within four or five years? Every large employer dumped their retiree drug because they it saved the money and there's no yeah. reason to be in the business. It, gradually, most large employers, some of the very largest that aren't going to have to deal with 50 different state exchanges, will, will eventually go into exchanges. I think there'll be more of a public exchange because you only get the your long code employees only get the money if they're a private exchange and if the public exchange. But I think, look, I think the world is going to be the federal employee health benefits plan in 20 years, and we're creeping that direction with exchanges, with Medicaid, and with Medicare. And eventually, you're going to have a little menu of 10 plans in your region, and you're going to get a premium. You're going to have premium support for that, God forbid. And I think that's where the world is heading. Inevitably, it's going to take 20 years. I think it's going to happen more slowly than Peter, but that's probably the right answer. And okay. I think structurally, it's always been the right answer. All right, last question. I want to go back to where we began. All the other industrialized democracies cover everybody. Uh, President Obama promised that he would cover everybody. We're now six months in. We have more than 40 million people in our country without health insurance. Should we get to universal coverage, and will we get to universal coverage? Yes and no. <laughs> I don't think you should have universal Western European socialized coverage medicine for everybody, because I think you're oversubsidizing wealthy people. I think you should cover needy and make sure that poor people have access to affordable, quality health care. And as you go in the income stream, you subsidize people less. I just don't think we should get into these massive income transfers, and that's what this issue is. How much of an income transfer do you want to be? How much do you want to look like Western Europe? How much do you want to keep? You know, I've, I've always been a fan of universal coverage. I've always been a fan of su subsidizing low-income people. Uh, I would do it at a hell of a lot less than this bill has. And I have a big problem collecting tax dollars from upper middle income people, running it through the federal mill, and redistributing the same people at 80 cents on the dollar. I think it's a big mistake. To me, that's the issue. Uh, very <laughs> depressing. Why did you end on that? Yeah, I, mean, I thought so you were going to say, yes, we're definitely going to do it because it's a moral imperative. That's what I thought we were going to say. Uh, that's what I say. That's my answer to that there question. Uh, let me just say thank you very much, Arthur. Thanks to everybody here. Thanks.